All right, uh, let's take a look. So yeah, it's uh, happy Monday, week six. Um, I guess we are halfway through our quarter now. Uh, you have a midterm on Wednesday, so I hope studying and preparing for that is going well. Um, I will send out a seating chart. Um, I don't, if, if you have like special needs or requests regarding like where you're sitting, you know, you can send me a message on campus wire. But otherwise, like there's no like left-handed or right-handed desks or anything like that. So, um, so I'll send out a seating chart. It's, it's going to say you're going to sit right over here, and uh, and that will be that. It should be. Uh, I hope it'll be clear um, where we where you'll sit. And, uh, We'll see you Wednesday. Okay. All right. Let's um, let's take a look at uh, at today's lecture. And so the course is kind of thematically divided into two parts. The first part covered a lot of kind of programming concepts, uh, intermediate to advanced programming concepts in R. And you know, even you know, between stats. 20 and 102A, you know, there's still only so much. You can only kind of scratch a little bit of the surface of, uh, of you know, like all of these programming concepts. And so, you know, if, if you do plan on doing more computer programming, I encourage you to read more of that advanced R textbook by Hadley Wickham. It's, it's very, very good. Um, and it gets, it gets real deep into stuff. Um, and then, you know, you can also try considering picking up another language like Python, which is, I think, also... Um, a great language and you know uh, it's good it's good to be uh, multilingual um, just like <laughs> as far as speaking language it, you know I, I feel like so hypocritical saying this because I can only speak English and <laughs> I'm, there's so many times where I'm like oh I wish I could communicate um, but but anyway we've got we have uh, but learning learning multiple computer languages is uh, is a good thing too um, but the second half of the course, after we've covered kind of a lot of these kind of com uh, programming concepts, the second half uh, focuses more on computational aspects. So we're going to cover some numeric methods. We're going to look at some computational statistics. And the, the big idea there is how, do, um, how can we harness the power of the computer to answer some of our mathematical problems, okay? Because the computer is very good at computing, right? It's very good at multiplying numbers, adding numbers, just doing a lot of kind of computations, okay? And um, uh, the it's not very good at understanding mathematics, right? Like uh, a lot of you are like data theory majors and some of you are not, but you know, some of you have taken like Math 115A or 131A and th th these are like heavy mathematical theory concepts and, and the computer is not good at that, okay? But it is very good at like crunching numbers. And, and so uh, a lot of kind of this computational uh, statistics and stuff is like how do we harness the computer's like sh skill set, okay, of like crunching numbers to kind of answer some of these, these questions. And so, um, so we're going to do uh, a little bit of that, okay? I mean, however much we can do in, you know, the remaining four or five weeks that we have. Um, but a key idea is that we have to understand also the limitations of the computer. And a lot of the limitations of the computer come from the fact that it is using floating point numbers and not real numbers, okay? So floating point numbers is how the computer stores numbers, and we have to understand that it is only able to store numbers approximately, okay? So if you think about like the number pi, okay? Think about the number pi. How many digits, decimal digits are there to the number pi? And you know, we know there's infinitely many digits, right? And, you know, I mean, sometimes you read some article saying like, oh, we've computed like the 10 billionth digit of pi or something. And I don't know what 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 digit we've we've figured out by now. Um, but, you know, there's like lots of things. And I don't know, maybe you've memorized the first <laughs> however many digits of pi. Um, if you think about that, how much if you wanted a computer 
and you wanted to store pi on your computer, how much storage would you need on your computer if you wanted to store like the number exactly? <laughs> you would need infinite storage on your computer, right? You would need to, you think like, okay, every digit of pi takes up just a tiny bit of storage, but like if you wanted to store the entire number, you would need infinite storage because, you know, there's, there's no end, okay? And so obviously that's not a practical solution. <laughs> we can't, we didn't, can't have infinite storage, all right? There's, I mean, there's not even infinite mass in the universe, right? So like even if we, every, every atom in the universe was dedicated towards storing the number of pi, like we, we wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and, and so anyway, as far as the computers go, um, somewhere along the way we said, well, you know what, 16 decimal places of precision is going to be good enough, right? Around 16 decimal places of precision. So we go, you know, some number point, we can go up to 16 places after the decimal, and that's going to be good enough. And, um, and that's what we have, okay? So the computer stores numbers approximately. And that's very different from real numbers. Because if you think about real numbers, and I don't know if any of you took real analysis yet or will take it, or maybe you're going to say, well, that's not for me. Um, and that's fine. Uh, you know, we think about like, okay, how do we define what the real numbers are? And there's, there's different definition and constructions, but kind of just intuitively, we can think of like the real number, you think of the real number line, right? You got this number line representing things and the integers are evenly spaced out. And how many real numbers are there? There's infinitely many, right? And then you take any two locations on the real number line, like zero and one, how many numbers are between 0 and 1? There's infinitely many. You take 0 and point 0.1, how many numbers are between 0 and point 0.1? Infinitely many, right? And it's, it's kind of mind-blowing, but there's just as many points between 0 and 1 as there are between 0 and 1,000. There's the, ex the exact same number of infinite <laughs> um, things, and you know there's like different infinities, right? You've got countable infinity and uncountable infinity and uh, whatever, okay? Um, so we have this, and you know, early on in our academic career, we've learned these properties of real numbers, okay? Um, I don't know, I think maybe somewhere, you know, like even in, maybe in third grade when you were multiple, learning your multiplication table, you learned like the commutative property, right? Like two times nine is the same thing as nine times two. And that can be extended to any kind of set of numbers. 2.1 times 9.8 is the same as 9.8 times 2.1. and and then we have like associativity and basically and, and the distributive property and you can kind of like group numbers together into like groups of 10 and multiply and stuff. And these are all like rules that we've learned apply to like how we do arithmetic and stuff. And this is, and like we hold these like truths, you know, uh, very dearly in our heart uh, when it comes to math. Now, um, the fact is, is when we are dealing with approximate storage of numbers, these properties no longer hold. And, it, and it's, a, it's a little bit unsettling, a little bit jarring to us. Um, and so I'll, I'll show you a few examples, okay? Uh, hang on a second. Let me log into Canvas over here. Um, so every number on the real number line has a decimal representation, okay? And the decimal re representation, you have a sign, so you either have a, a, a negative sign in front of it or you don't, okay? And then basically, you think of a number like 5,413.29, and we understand that this is five thousandths times 10 to the third, and then four one hundredths, four times 10 to the two, plus you know, one times 10, and three times 10 to the zero, and this is two tenths, so two times 10 to the negative one, and nine one hundredths, nine times 10 to the negative two. And we understand that this is how we represent, we represent numbers, right? Um, and if we wanted to represent something in scientific notation, okay, we can say, all right, this thing, we can just kind of like move the decimal place around, and we multiply it by some factor, uh, some power of 10, and it's also equivalent, right? And this is not surprising to us because, um, you know, we're accustomed to it, right? But this, this you know, 
this this is like a big deal, right? Uh, you know, you think back to ancient uh, ma mathematics where they didn't have a representation for zero and this idea of like, um, you know, representing, you know, having zero as a placeholder for things like that. You know, being able to, to do that really uh, changed the way we were able to think about numbers. Okay, so that number 5,413.29 can also be represented as uh, 541,329 times 10 to the minus 2. Now that's, this is technically scientific notation, but that's weird. People are, would be weirded out by this. But kind of our normalized scientific notation is this idea that, you know, you put one value in front of the point, one value in front of the decimal point, so you have 5.41329 times 10 to the third, and that is, um, that's equivalent to 5,413.29, right? These two numbers are exactly equivalent. And, uh, and this, is, this is how we represent, you know, really big numbers or really small numbers. So like, uh, you know, one mole is, is this, right? Uh, Avogadro's number or something, you know, some, some really big uh, thing times 10 to the 23rd. And uh, I forgot what this is. This is like Planck's constant or something, right? Like this kind of smallest units of stuff. and and, and we can represent these, you know, really big and really small things. Um, we often like to do things in decimal representation. Um, and, you know, some fractions have finite decimal representations. Like, we can represent them exactly. Like, if we want to represent the number one half in decimal, we can do it exactly and represent it with 0 0.5. Okay? Um, other numbers, like square root of 2 or pi or e, these have infinite decimal representation, okay? And even like rational numbers, like one third, they have decimal representations, but their decimal representations are also infinite, right? Like you can't represent the number one third exactly. You have to write 0 0.3333333, and there's this understanding that the threes go on forever. Now, obviously, if you wanted to write this down on a piece of paper, you can't write down um, <laughs> <laughs> threes forever, okay? And, and we have like this bar. We put a bar over the three to say like they keep going on, right? But the computer doesn't kind of understand math in this way, of this concept of like the things go on forever. And so you have to kind of just truncate it and you just say like, okay, we have zero point and then maybe I'll write like threes like eight des you know, eight times, point three, 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 three. And then I'm gonna just kind of stop there and we might understand, okay, this is how we represent one third, okay? But the computer sees this thing and it doesn't know, like, is this, it, it doesn't know or care, okay? It just sees a bunch of 0 0.33333 and it ends and it says, okay, that's, that's that. And, and a consequence of that is that um, it breaks the rules of real numbers. So, um, so what did I write here? So computers are unable to represent real numbers with infinite precision. They don't have infinite storage, so we have to use a fixed number of, of bits, okay? And so everything's kind of approximated, and because we're approximating our numbers, things happen. Okay, so let's think about this very simple arithmetic operation. 10 divided by 3 times 3, okay? What is that equal to? It's not a trick question. It's equal to 10, right? We do 10 divided by 3. We multiply by 3. We get 10. That's how real numbers work. Um, I don't, did you ever use, like, a very simple four-function calculator? Um, like, I don't know when the last time you used one of these was, like, maybe fifth grade or something. Okay? Um, I don't know. Did you ever play around with it? And just to see, like, uh, you know, you ever, like, multiply really big numbers, you try, like, 99999 times 99999, and then, it, like, you get an E and it breaks and stuff like that, and you ever try to do the opposite and it also breaks. And um, But anyway, what would happen if you did this operation on the calculator? What if you did 10 divided by 3 on the calculator? What would, what would you get? 3.33333, okay? And then if you take that and you multiply it by 3, what do you get? You would get 9.99999, right? So, so here, I did this here. I, I can do it here. I actually recorded a video of myself doing this. All right? So, so here I go. 10 divided by 3, 3.33333. No surprise. We're going to multiply that by 3, and I get 9.99999, right? So we don't get 
Uh, what's that? Make this public. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. This, is, this would be my all-time uh, hit video on, on YouTube. <laughs> like, comment, and subscribe. All right. Um, so, th you know, that's, that's what we get, right? We get 9.99999, all right? And, and we understand this, right? We understand, like, okay, you know, that makes sense, right? Because the calculator does 10 divided by 3, and it gives us 3.333. That makes sense. 10 divided by 3, representative of the calculator would be that. And we take that and we multiply by 3, and we get 9.99999, and we go, all right, you know, not 10, but whatever. That's, that happens, okay? What about this? 10 times 3 divided by 3, okay? Well, on the calculator, what would we get? We would get 10, right? So here, here's the other video. <laughs> 10 times 3, 30 divided by 3, we get 10, okay? Um, and, and, and it's not... I don't, it, that doesn't feel shocking or surprising, but if you think about what the mathematical implications are of this, it's rather, I don't, I don't know if it's unsettling or it's just kind of like, oh, oh dear, this like breaks a fundamental rule of mathematics, right? Because one of the fundamental rules is like, if we had real numbers, 10 divided by 3 times 3 should be the exact same thing as 10 times 3 divided by 3, right? But we're getting different things. We're getting 9.99999, and over here we're getting 10. Now, we see this and we go, oh, okay, that's that's like the, com the calculator trying to represent 10, but the calculator doesn't know this. The computer doesn't know this. This, uh, you know, how do we know that this is not like you're buying something at the 99 cent store that's, <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, I, and you're not actually, you know, you, you know, I don't know, whatever, okay. but. Um, and, and so we're getting something that's similar in value, but not exactly the same, right? So this is this breaks one of the kind of fundamental rules. And in a nutshell, that's, uh, I guess that's like the main takeaway <laughs> of this entire lecture, is that you have to be aware that when you're dealing with numbers on the computer, a lot of these fundamental rules that we are expecting to hold do not hold, okay? and. And it's not always easy to know when things will work out and when things won't, right? Like, when do we get something like this where we get the actual number 10 versus when do we get something like this where we get something that's close to but not exactly equal to 10? And sometimes, you know, you do a co computation like this and then the error, right, which isn't huge, 9, 10 versus 9.99999, they're very close to each other, but that kind of error can also magnify and grow into something a lot larger. And um, and so there are implications there. Uh, and so we have to kind of just be mindful and aware of that um, because that's going to, that it plays a role when you do all of these kind of computational things later when we're trying to approximate stuff using the computer. Um, so we have to kind of be aware of that. The, the rest of today's lecture is going to get into like the details of how computers store numbers and um, um, and the, the system in which the, the computer stores numbers, which is the IEEE 7547. We're going to spend the rest of today's lecture and also uh, Friday covering the details of this. Because um, well, I guess I, I think it's kind of neat. And it's, uh, it's actually a really uh, ingenious and clever system for storing numbers, you know, given uh, the, the, the architecture of the computer. All right, let me go ahead and give you your first view quiz answer, which is the letter D, D as in dog. D as in dog is your first view quiz answer. Uh, okay, so here are some other examples where the calculator just doesn't work out. And I don't know if these are surprising to us or not, but if you do the square root of 2 and then you take that number and you multiply it by itself on the calculator, you get something close to but not exactly equal to 2. Whereas if you do 2 squared and you get 4 and you ask for the square root of that, you get exactly 2. Um, on uh, let me clear out some of this stuff here. How do I? Um, I'm gonna uh, blow this up. All right. So let's say I do a is zero point one. Okay. So what is a? A is point one. All right. B is going to be zero point three divided by three. Okay. What's B? B is 0 0.1. Okay, now here's a question. What what will this return? 
a equals equals b. And it returns false, right? And you're like, what? Okay, a point one, b point one, a equal equal b, false. All right. So that's, that feels frustrating, right? And you're just and, and you go, wait, is a equal to point one? Yeah, but is b equal to point one? No. Are you sure? B, you know, and so it feels it feels weird, right? Okay. Uh, d, I'm gonna put in zero point three. Okay. So what's d? Zero point three. What's e? e is going to be 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2. So what's e? e is 0 0.3. Okay, so now, now you are expecting what I'm going to say. If I say, what's d equal to e? Is d equal to e? False. Okay. All right. Uh, what about f? f is going to be 0 0.15 plus 0 0.15. f is 0 0.3. Okay, what is d equal to f? It is okay. <laughs> so, um, but so so you have d is 0.3, e is 0.3, f is 0.3. You know, d is not equal to e, but d is equal to f. E. What about e and f? Those are not right. So it's like, oh gosh, what are you doing, computer? Um, <laughs> how am I supposed to know? And and it's like, oh, you don't. Okay. Um, so it, it, it can be frustrating. So here's here's example 0.1 and 0.3 divided by three. You get 0.1. Um, you know, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, it looks like 0 0.3, and b is 0.3, but are those things equal? They're not. Um, what if I do a sequence, right? Whoops. Um, and I say, okay, let's make a sequence uh, from 0 to 1 uh, by steps of 0.1. Okay, so here's s. Okay, what is the uh, fourth value in s is 0 0.3. Is that equal to 0 0.3? And and it's not. Okay, so and again, it's it it's frustrating. <laughs> it's frustrating. But but um, when you're not accustomed to it, it feels frustrating. But then you know, I'm I see this and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just that's just how the numbers work, right? It's like uh, uh, you get kind of used to <laughs> the the fact that the computers don't really don't really understand this, right? And you see numbers like, oh, 1 times 10 to the negative 16, and you're like, oh, that's that's 0. That's just the computer's way of storing 0 and stuff, right? So I, I can say, like, okay, what did, you know, what was A? A is 0.1, and B is this, and A minus B, 0 0.1 minus 0 0.1, right? If I do 0.1 minus 0 0.1, I get 0. But if I do A minus B, I get 1.38 times 10 to the negative 17. And I look at that and go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the computer saying zero, okay? And uh, you know, it's not zero, but I, I also understand this is close enough to zero as well. So, um, and we get a little bit of understanding when we ask, um, you know, computer, show me twenty digits, okay? Because I think by default it go cuts off at like fifteen or sixteen decimal places. And then so we say, all right, show 20 digits. And then we say, oh, you know what? The computer is actually not able. If you think about the number 0.1, it is not able to store the number 0.1 um, exactly in the computer, right? Just like this calculator is not able to represent um, 3 and a third, 10 divided by 3. It's not able to represent it exactly here. The computer is also not able to store 0.1 exactly. And so when it stores it, it gets 0 0.1000, you know, something very close to one, but not exactly one. And again, with two, you get something very close to 0 0.2, but not exactly. And if you add these two numbers up, you get something very close to 0 0.3, but not exactly 0 0.3. Um, and then when you ask the computer, what is 0 0.3 itself? Again, when you ask the computer 0 0.3 itself, it's, a, it's something very close to 0 0.3, but not exactly 0 0.3. And when you take these two things and you add them together, or I mean, you compare them, the computer says, oh, this thing is not exactly equal to this thing, therefore they're not equal. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, here's 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 minus 0.1 and 0 0.5 minus 0.2 and 0 0.6 minus 0.3 and 0 0.7 minus 0.4. In real numbers, all of these things are exactly identical, exactly the same thing. But when we use computer approximations for these numbers, they're not, OK? Uh, it, we, we have five values of 0.3. There's actually 
three distinct values. We have point two nine 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 point three zero 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 zero, you know, ending with a four, and then I have point two nine 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 ending with a three. All of these things look like point three to the computer, but also the computer says, well, they're not also not exactly equal to each other. So we have three distinct values. Will you ever get to a point where you can predict exactly which of these things they'll be? No. You, you're, you are not a computer, all right? So you won't know, like, okay, this operation is going to return this one, and this operation is going to return this one. You, like, I don't think anyone's going to get that good, okay? But if you can understand that this is just how the computer kind of does things, and you can anticipate, all right, um, I'm going to get something close to 0.3, but not exactly equal to 0.3, you can kind of uh, keep that in mind when you're designing your things. And so you would not do an if statement where you're going to do if 0.1 plus 0.2 is equal, equal to 0.3, because that's going to um, you know, return false, right? So you have to kind of keep that in mind and um, uh, you know when you're when you're doing uh, you know designing kind of you know little scripts to uh, to work around these operations. All right. So the way computers store numbers is in binary. Um, some of you fully understand binary. Uh, for others of you, it's a little bit new. Um, but you think about you know the way decimal uh, representation works, right? You have a ones place, you have a tens place, a hundreds place, a thousands place, and basically just powers of ten. In binary, we have the same concept. You have a ones place, but everything's a power of two. So you have a ones place, a twos place, a fours place, an eights place, a sixteenths place, and so on and so forth. So these are the uh, first 16 numbers in binary. You start off with zero, which is going to just be all zeros. And then you have a one, a one in the ones place, and then a two, which is a one in the twos place, a zero in the ones place. 3 is 2 plus 1, so we have a two, 1 in the 2's place and a 1 in the 1's place. And then 4 is going to be 1, 0, 0. 5 is 1, 0, 1. Uh, 1 in the 4's place, 1 in the 1's place. 6 is 1 in the 4's place, 1 in the 2's place, and 0, 0 in the 1's place. And 7 is, you know, 1, 1, and 1. So 4, 2, and 1. And, you know, with that, you can, like, start counting in binary, and uh, you can count up to 31 in one hand, and you can count up to 1,023 in two hands. And it's I think it's, a, like, a fun little exercise to practice, right? You say this is 1, and this is 2, and this is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, um, you know, 16. Your thumb is 16, and you get up to 31 that way. And then if you practice the... The left hand for me is harder, uh, but you can get up to 1,023. I, I, you know, probably not worth doing that. But um, but try counting up to 31 on one hand. Um, you know, just kind of flipping your um, your pinky up and down. Okay, um, so that's that's binary representation, um, and I hope that's okay. And so just kind of a breakdown of like if we wanted to represent the number 11, what does this look like? You know, we have. Um, you know, 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3. We have a 1 in the 2 to the 3 or the 8's place, a 0 in the 4's place, a 1 in the 2's place, and a 1 in the 2 to the 0, 1 in the 1's place. So 8 and 2 and 1 make 11. This is how we would represent the number, the decimal number 11 in, in binary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, it's always, we have a, a binary, we have a point to represent values, uh, I don't I don't know, <laughs> okay, we have a point, and then so uh, at, to the left we have 2 to the 0, and 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, going that way, and then, um, and then the other way we would have 2 to the negative 1, 2 to the negative 2. Uh, so the the point kind of represents the the center, and things go bigger this way and then smaller the other way. So, um, so here is how we would rep represent fractional values, fractional values in binary. So if you think about decimals, okay, you have the decimal point, and the first place to the right of the decimal point is the tenths, ten to the negative one, and then two places to the right of that would be ten to the negative two or the hundredths place. And 
three places would be 10 to the negative three. So similarly, you have a point, and in binary, it's no longer the decimal, it's now the binary point, okay? And at the binary point, first place to the right is two to the negative one, the one halves place. And then two spaces to the right would be two to the negative two, or the one quarters place. And three spaces to the right would be two to the negative three, or the one eighths. So to represent one half in binary is 0.1. To represent one quarter in binary would be 0 0.01. And to represent one eighth in binary would be 0 0.001. And if you have something like this, 0.375 in decimal is equal to three eighths. This is one quarter and one eighth is three eighths. So you have 0 0.011. Does that kind of make sense as far as a binary representation of fractional values? 0 0.011 would be uh, 1 quarter and 1 eighth for 3 eighths. Okay. I've given you one view quiz answer. Okay, so your second view quiz answer today is the letter A. A as in apple. A as in apple is your second view quiz answer. So... This is kind of the, the crux of the issue, is that most real numbers have infinite binary representation. So something like the decimal value 1 tenth, 0.1 in decimal, in binary is represented with 0 0.00011000011, and you have this 0011 repeating forever and ever and ever, kind of like if you wanted to represent one third in decimal, you have to have a bunch of 0.33333 with the threes repeating forever. In binary, you have a bunch of zeros and ones repeating forever. And the computer can only store a finite number of these things, okay? 52 of them to be precise. And, and so you're gonna have an approximate value. And that's why when you do stuff like 0.1 plus 0.2, is that equal to 0.3? It returns false, okay? The binary approximation of these numbers just don't add up to the other binary approximation. They're not exactly the same. Sometimes they are, like 0.15 plus 0.15 is the, equal to the binary approximation for 0.3, but um, you know, 0.1 plus 0.2 is not, and, and it's frustrating. There's, there's no real way to kind of know. <laughs> um, so I want to introduce the IEEE 754 standard, which is how we how we store numbers on the computer okay so um, you know the computers which which is really a miracle of engineering is right we zapped electricity into silicon like basically like rocks right uh, I mean highly refined rocks but um, but rocks nonetheless we zapped electricity into it and now they're able to do all kinds of stuff we put like billions of these things on a on a single chip, all these transistors here, and we can play, you know, virtual reality games and stuff. And you know, I'm very excited for PSVR2 and whatever. But but you know, it's it's amazing, okay? And you know, um, I, you know, generations ago, decades ago, um, the electrical engineers who were designing computer chips said, you know what, we need to come up with a standard for how we are going to store numbers on computer chips. And they came up with this IEEE 754 standard, and this is implemented at a hardware level, okay? So there's nothing you can do in ours software that is going to change how a number is stored in the computer, okay? And, and whether you use Python or C or C++ or any language, when you ask your computer program to store a number, it is stored using this standard in the system, and, and, and all modern computer chips use this standard as far as uh, storing numbers. So whether you have an Apple with M1 silicon or, uh, you know, some Intel chip or AMD or, you know, even on your, uh, your phones which use some other ARM architecture, they all kind of uh, adhere to this IEEE standard. It was revised in 2008, but the 2008 specification still contains the entirety of the original specification from 1985. Um, the Wikipedia article on the IEEE standard, IEEE 754 standard is very excellent. It's an it's A-plus article, so if you want to read more about it, 
um, you, you can learn about it. I mean, if you've taken a CS course, you probably might have covered all of this stuff, but I imagine for a lot of you, this uh, this was not covered. So um, the way we store this is we think of, all right, we are going to store a number in scientific notation, but binary, okay? Binary scientific notation. So you think of, you know, decimal scientific notation and the analog uh, in binary. And so in decimal scientific notation, in standardized scientific notation, you have one digit in front of your decimal point, and then you multiply it by some power of 10, okay? We're gonna do the same thing, but in binary, we're gonna have a digit in front of the binary point, you know, digits trailing it, and we're gonna multiply it by some power of two, okay? Because we're now dealing in binary. Um, if you think of normalized scientific notation, that value in front of the decimal point cannot be a zero, okay? It's gotta be some number between one and nine. Same concept applies in binary. It can't be a zero, but if it's binary, if it can't be zero, then it must be a one, okay? So it's always gonna have a one, with a point, one point, something, 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 times two to the something else, okay? We're also gonna have, you know, something, either it's gonna be positive or negative. And so we have kind of a sign, uh, whether it's positive or negative. We have the values trailing the point, and then we have the exponent, two to the sum power. And then um, we don't need to store the number in front of the binary point because we know it's gonna be a one, okay? We know it's gonna be a one. We don't need to store it because that would be like a waste of memory to kind of store this number, which is always one. If it's always one, there's no need to kind of save it anywhere. So let's think of this number, 6.375, which is six and three eighths. How would we store this in binary, okay? So in regular binary, not scientific, we would say, okay, six and three eighths, we have to represent six in binary, which would be four plus two plus zero. Okay, so we have a one, one, and zero. So that's uh, four, two, and zero is the six. And then the three eighths would be point zero, one, one, uh, no halves, one quarter, and one eighth, right? So this is how we would represent six and three eighths in binary. Is that okay with everybody? One, one, zero, point zero, one, one. Now I wanna represent this in binary scientific. So how do you represent something in scientific notation? You take the point and you move it over. We're gonna move it two spaces to the left. So it's gonna become 1.10011. So rather than 110.011, I have the same digits, but I just move that point two spaces over. So I have 1.10011. And because I moved it two spaces over, I have to multiply it by two to the two. The, the exponent's a two because that's how many spaces I moved it over, right? And so it, it feels a little bit funny to read this, but that number six and three eighths is one plus one half plus zero quarters plus zero eighths plus one sixteenth plus one thirty second, okay? And we multiply that by two to the two or we multiply that by four. So when you do the full thing, you get 1.59375 times four, and you get six and three eighths, which also kind of makes sense, because if you think of the one plus the half, that's one and a half times four will give me six. And then here I have 1 16th plus 1 32nd. 1 16th and 1 32nd is uh, 3 30 seconds. 3 30 seconds times four would be 3 eighths. So I have six and 3 eighths as well, okay? So, um, so this is basically what we would do, we would take the binary representation and turn it into binary scientific and then we try to store something like this. Um, in the computer there's actually different <laughs> specifications for um, how to store our numbers and um, you know back in the day when computer memory was like a expensive quantity and you know it was like to have like one megabyte of RAM was was like a remarkable thing. You know, if you think, I don't know if you ever played like the original Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers, like you can get it on like Nintendo Switch Online or whatever, you know, you can play the original game. Um, that entire game fit on like 32 kilobytes of memory, which which is like 
<laughs> Amazing, right? You you write like a few scripts and it already takes up a, a a huge amount of space. And so you know that that was stored on you know, and now you know now we have like what sixteen gigabytes of RAM, and you can use the cloud storage for you know petabytes of storage and things like that. Well, anyway. Um, Back in the day, we said, oh, maybe we only want to use 32 bits of memory for each number, and that was single precision. Today, we have kind of an abundance of memory, and so we all use double precision floating point, which uses 64 bits, and that, that's good enough for most circumstances. If you have like um, some, some application that requires a high amount of precision, you can use long double, which will use 80 bits of memory. Um, but basically, on R, all of your decimal values are double precision floating point, which is why you get type double, um, and uh, and that that's all of our floating points. And we don't have, uh, and R doesn't even have a single floating point. Um, you know, if you were using a different computer language like C or something, you can specify single floating point precision and stuff like that. Um, so double floating point uses 64 bits, and the budget. Those 64 bits are allocated, one bit for the sign, so we can have positive or negative numbers, uh, 11 bits for the exponent, 52 bits for the mantissa, okay? And, and we can represent a whole bunch of numbers like this. So those 11 bits that get used for the exponent, how many unique values can you represent with 11 bits? So you'd think of 2 to the 11th power, 2 to the 11th power is 2048, right? We all know 2 to the 10 is 1024. 2 to the 10, that should be kind of one of those things where it's like, okay, 2 to the 10 is approximately 1,000, all right? So that's that's like a good thing. 2 to the 10, approximately 1,000, 1,000, 1024. So 2 to the 11 is 2048, 2048 um, values. And we reserve two of those numbers for special purposes. So we reserve all zeros for a special case and we reserve all ones for a special case. So that leaves us with 2046 numbers because uh, two of those, you know, 2048 minus two, 2046. Um, so that uh, we have 2046 values left. We're going to say half of those will be positive, one will be zero, and the rest will be negative. Okay, so 2046 divided by two is 1,023. We're going to have 1,023 positive numbers, a 0, and 1,022 negative numbers. So we can represent values from negative 1,022 up to 1,023 with the 2,046 values. Okay, And and those correspond to basically everything is, is a 0 with a 1 up to everything is a 1 except the last one's a 0 because all 1's is special and all zeros is special. So the difference between 2046 and 1023 is 1023, and that that's implemented by what we call an exponent bias of 1023. Okay, um, and so to if we wanted to represent any kind of number, we add the bias, and that's how we're going to store it in binary. So if you think of uh, using two to the uh, 11, right? You have your 11 bits and you list off every single possible one and you think of like, okay, what's the, what does it correspond to decimal, right? So all zeros is zero. All ones gives up to 2047. And the zero is a special case and two, the all ones is a special case. And then so the remaining numbers going one from 2046 has to represent some negative values um, and some positive values. So the 1 will correspond to negative 1,022. 2 will correspond to negative 1,021. So basically, we have an offset of 1,023. I take this number and I subtract off 1,023. And then the very largest value you can represent would be 2046. I subtract 1,023. The largest number I can represent will be 1,023. Um, it feels a little bit funny. We'll, I'll cover this in, uh, we have a mini floating point representation, um, and we'll do that. The uh, the all case, the case of all ones is a special case. We use that to represent numbers like infinity and nans, and then the case of all zeros is a special case, um, and we use that to represent subnormalized or denormalized numbers, which I'll cover in, uh, in Friday's lecture. So let me um, get into just a small example of our mini, mini floating point representation, which is 
I'm gonna follow all the same rules of the IEEE 754 specification, but I'm only gonna have eight bits, okay? Uh, but we're gonna follow all of the same rules. Let me go ahead and give you your last view quiz answer for today, which is the letter E. E as an elephant, E as an elephant. So our eight bits are gonna get allocated. We'll have one bit for the sign, so I can have positive and negative numbers. We're gonna use three bits for the exponent, and we're gonna have four bits for the mantissa. So if I have eight bits, this is how our numbers will get represented, okay? So uh, one bit for the sign. If it's a positive number, our bit is zero. If it's a negative number, our sign bit is a one. Uh, a consequence of this is that we technically have two representations of zero. We have a positive zero and a negative zero, which is a little bit of an oxymoron because zero is neither positive nor negative, but, but we, you know, with this, we're gonna have a positive zero and a negative zero. With the three bits for the exponent, we have eight unique values that we can have, right? Two to the three is eight. We have eight unique values and they're all listed off here. So I can go from zero to seven. We reserve all zeros for a special case. We reserve all ones for a special case, which leaves me with six numbers, okay? With six numbers, half of those are positive. So I got one, two, three. One is a zero and the rest are negative. So I can represent values from negative two to positive three. And, and this means I have an offset or a bias of three. So when I, when I store the exponent 110, which is six in decimal, that corresponds to a three with the, uh, with the bias. And if I have 001, which is you know, one in decimal, I have an offset of you know, minus three, and that corresponds to negative two, okay? And this is how we would represent all of the, the values in between. So, uh, and then the four bits for the mantissa you think of binary scientific notation that's always leading with a one, and so the four bits basically are the spots after the binary point. So I've got one point blank, 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 four, four spaces, and those are where the mantissa bits go. So let's look at this number and break it down. So if I have eight bits, I might have a number that looks like this, and I say, okay, what number does this correspond to in decimal? So we look at this, I have a zero for the sign, the next three are for the exponent, so I have an exponent of 101, and my mantissa bits are 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so I'm breaking this up into the sine, the three for the exponent, and for the four for the mantissa. So the exponent bits are 101, which is five in binary. We have an exponent bias of three, so our exponent value is two. <laughs> okay, let me go back to this chart. Okay, and we say, okay, in binary, 101 is five in decimal, we have the bias of three, and so this becomes a two, okay? And that's what we have here. So our exponent bits are 101, which corresponds to an exponent value of two. The mantissa bits are 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, okay? So we plug those in to the place, right? 1.0111, we take the 0, 1, 1, 1, and we have that, and this is gonna be two to the two, our exponent is two. So what is this equal to? One plus zero halves plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth. We're multiplying that by two to the two, and so we're gonna get four plus one plus one half plus one fourth. We're gonna get a total of five and three quarters, 5.75, okay? Is that all right? Going from zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, one to 5.75, okay. Uh, all right, what about this? How would we represent 2.25 in our mini floating point system? Two and a quarter, okay? Two and a quarter in decimal, the two would be a one zero, and one quarter would be 0 0.01, right? So two and a quarter, 2.25, would be one zero point zero one. I want to turn this into binary scientific. So what do I do? I move this point over one spot, and we're gonna get 1.001 times two to the one, okay? So now I need to store the exponent as, which is a one, and then my mantissa bits will be zero, zero, one, and then technically there's a zero after that, okay? So I got 1.001 times two to the one. Oh, the sine bit is zero because it's a positive number. The mantissa bits will be 0 0.0010, okay? 0010 is the mantissa. And then the exponent 
the exponent value is 2 to the 1, we have a bias of 3, right? So if we want to represent the number 1 in decimal, um, we add the bias of 3, and that's going to um, uh, become a 4, which becomes 1, 0, 0. So again, going back to kind of our, our table here, if our, if our exponent is 1, in decimal we add the bias of 3, which will get stored as 1, 0, 0. So um, our number in binary, using our floating point system, 0 for the sign, 1, 0, 0 for the exponent, 0, 0, 1, 0 for the mantissa. And that's going to be, that's going to be the number. Okay, uh, I gave you all three view quiz answers. All right, so we will go ahead and end here for today. We will continue this talk on Friday. Uh, I will see you on Wednesday for the midterm exam. I will send out a seating chart, and, uh, and we will see you on Wednesday. Good luck.